uh, Theo Forge Stiegler here for our March Author Jam in 2023. I'm delighted to be joined by Tennyson, Dave, Marie, and Rihanna, and uh, want to invite us to just uh, share a brief introduction and uh, what's going on for you, what's top of mind in the work that you do at the moment, and uh, what's a question that you bring that if you had some answer to it today would really be impactful. Uh, maybe for this week, maybe just for today, maybe for the rest of the year, however you want to frame that. And I'm curious if anybody feels moved to to want to start, and then I'll let that person decide who goes next. I'll start, Theo. All right. So Rihanna Moore, I'm located in uh, far western New York State, way out toward the Pennsylvania border, um, right on the one of the Great Lakes, Lake Erie. And uh, this is actually where I, I was born and grew up. And then I lived away for 45 years and came back about nine years ago. So um, I'm enjoying being back in my home territory. Um, there's two things I want to say about what I'm working on right now. One is uh, I actually need to um, put a, some kind of finish, some kind of coda on the chapter that I've written for uh, the change library. So <laughs> that's uh, sort of, you know, on one of the front burners. Um, the most recent thing I'm working on is um, the working title, and I haven't shared this with anyone yet. I really, I just had the inspiration for it about three days ago because this is, this is really my life's work uh, for probably the last 35 years is uh, around understanding power dynamics on multiple dimensions of diversity in, in the US and in the world. Um, I've been working on a, like a generic inclusive um, chart graphic of uh, power dynamics. Um, and I'm calling the, the top group insiders and the bottom group outsiders. And that can relate to any dimension of diversity. So um, if you have dyslexia, for example, or some other hidden disability, um, you would experience, you would have outsider experiences in many social contexts. Um, if you're a person of color in the United States, you would have an outsider experience many times uh, in any given day. Um, uh, and so, but I, I'm not limiting it to, um, I'm not limiting it to just one dimension of diversity. I'm working on it from to be inclusive of any dimension of diversity that that anyone might name. But the the most recent thing that came to me is, and I identify as a white person. Um, this is like two days ago. I started working on this um, a, a similar graphic, uh, essentially a timeline or a continuum that will portray. Um, White, Amer white America's history of violence against people of color in the United States. So um, I've started working on that. And my question springs from that, which is, I'd be curious to know how each of you, because I think you have different specialties from mine. Um, race, uh, race power dynamics is really my specialty, like, like a sub sub specialty. <laughs> um, um, do you, what's your opinion? You know, what do you think about how much um, Americans in general, and it could be just in your own spheres of influence or where you move in social space, care about um, power dynamics, whether their own insider or their own outsider dynamics, like how important is it for people to understand that? Um, conceptually and then apply it to their their own lives i if you have an opinion about that i'd love to hear it so that's my question i think it's a central conversation i think it's absolutely critical and i i think it's been undervalued as a as a topic area i think what you're focusing on is absolutely brilliant and necessary and needed so I mean, that's that's my quick quick Thank response I, i'm excited by your work and I can't wait to see it. I'd love to to, to chat. I, I'm so zeroed in on that that area right now. It's it's kind of 
um, well, selfishly speaking, it's, it's beneficial um, to to hear this. So I'm putting my um, email, my most often used email and my phone number. I'd welcome a conversation from you and from anyone. And you I've will been... you will all get I I part of my role here is to make sure that I allow all of you to be in this conversation, not have to worry about where somebody puts something. So I'm gonna capture this for you all and you'll get a follow-up with a document that has you know the the wonderful resources that Keith has put in the chat and and so forth. I want to very briefly, um, uh, Rihanna. These two have thank you very much been next to my bed, but with teaching the graduate course, um, <laughs> I had a student in my leadership class ask us, "Do you have some book recommendations?" I'm like, "Yes, give me one minute." So <laughs> here is the uh, the brief read um, on gaslighting and dog whistles that um, Rihanna had a hand in and. Um, Junior of race, color, and culture. I'll uh, make sure that those are also captured for for folks to to have a look see on on what you're the, sharing, Rihanna. The gaslights and dog whistles book. The main author is a friend of mine, and I just contributed to it. But it's for people who and who have, um, I guess, a similar mindset to mine around working racial power dynamics in particular, um, and who are being confronted by uh, people who are. Um, you know, who are deniers, basically, um, who are creating the dog whistles and doing the gaslighting and how to how to engage with those people, how to get into dialogue with them rather than polarizing from them. So it's kind of a how to book. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to chime in that, you know, it's a it's a miracle I'm here because I this is the first one I've ever been to. And it was exactly this question, Rihanna, that has brought me. So huh. I will reach out to you. I'm part of the nonviolent um, communication community. And the work I'm doing now, I'm mostly retired, but the work I'm doing now is uh, trying to help uh, nonviolent communication trainers be more cultural change agents within organizations and systems rather than just communication trainers uh -huh. you know because the whole underpinning of NVC and Marshall Rosenberg's work yeah. was social justice yeah. yeah but I don't know if you know but I'd, I'm going to reach out to you and, and when you have time I'd be delighted to talk is there's a raging controversy within my community right now because uh a very different way, kind of, I, I, I'm very ignorant. I have to, you know, I'm Asian American. I identify as Okinawan, but I live in Hawaii. And so our, our entire racial system and diversity include DEI is very different than probably any other place in the United States because we're majority non-white, right? So we're the only state that, that is like that. But what I wanted to say is that, um, and what I, the question I have for this group and anything you can do to support would be so welcomed is there's enemy images in, in my community by some people that anything to do with organized systems is evil. I mean, you have this, this extreme and it's, it's visceral. Like sometimes I can barely stand to be in that conversation because I feel so and easy inside of me. And I'm not white and I don't come from privilege, you know? Um, so so maybe I've absorbed some of that, but you know, I grew up in Hawaii. So the, the hope that I have is that when we look from the industrial revolution forward, of course it was a violent system. It reduced people to, to cogs and uh, you know, it took away craft and made it into, made people into machine like robots, right? The assembly line and all this evolution. But I'm, I have this curiosity and this hope that organization development is really the, um, not the antidote, but the thing that's driving sort of our evolution from that dehumanization into rehumanization. I don't know how to say it. It's the first time these words are jumbling out of my mouth. So I'm not exactly sure how coherent I am. But I wonder if somebody has written or researched something kind of like what Rihanna is doing, you know, like a, a landscape view 
of OD maybe and how much we are contributing to the rehumanization. We see it obviously in pockets like the change handbook as a collection of stuff. But I, I'm wondering if, you know, there's so many key um, concepts, for example, that NVC shares with OD. And, and that's what I want to teach to these trainers. This is why this 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 concept of nonviolent communication can be so acceptable and professional in organizations, not soft and fluffy, but really relevant to productivity. You know, we had the Google study, of course, you know, that showed, um, and by the way, Microsoft, Google, they're all reading my book or Marshall Rosenberg's book because they can't talk to each other. You know, they go to these meetings and they humiliate each other in these executive meetings. So Satya Navdella was one of the first, um, you know, to talk about that. But if somebody hasn't done that, it might be a fun project, you know, to even look at concepts like emergence and um, inclusion. You know, these are all concepts that OD shares with nonviolent communication or any of our methodologies, but to explicitly name like, yeah, OD is rehumanizing and there's hope. All organizations are not evil. In fact, they're probably the mechanism for change. So uh -huh. anyway, I'm just uh -huh. blurting that out. But that's really <laughs> hot for me right now because I show up into these conversations and it's clear they have a visceral enemy image is the best way I can say it of organizations. And it doesn't matter what kind. It's kind of like the... Um, Critical social justice, I'm not even sure if I'm using the word right, but kind of the concept of like deconstructing everything versus possibly what we do, which is to go into systems and try to work from there to make better, mm -hmm. you know, which is, I think, what's being called liberal social justice. You know, you, you have to totally ignore me because I saw one YouTube video and I'm still confused. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there's this whole conversation going on with words and concepts that I don't even understand, you know? And by the way, Rihanna, when just as, so anything you have on that, Theo, you know, I wonder if Steve, you know, it, it knows of anything or if there's something we can do as a collective, because I worry that, that some people's solution to solving, you know, inequity and power differentials is to just, have chaos and destroy everything. I mean, I'm being extreme here, but I think you might know what, am I making some sense? Uh, if you can give me- Absolutely. Some... Yeah, okay. And, and uh -huh. I'll, I'll just very briefly say that there are a number of doctoral students uh, currently in our um, doctorate for uh, organization development and change that are trying to lean into exactly some of these questions that you're talking about. And and I think of it maybe more as, as seeds to a budding, set of fields that we're that we're working on here collectively so i think there certainly would be a space for a group like the people that i'm looking at on the screen to to contribute there as well but um you know i, I resonate with what keith is saying in the chat and what cliff just offered that this is such like if we're not talking about this right now when are we going to start talking about this yeah yeah and I'll, I'll just end with this and then and then turn over to to i don't know Dave, maybe because yeah, he's not a lot. Off. I'm sorry. Is, is, is um, you know, Rihanna, even this concept, you we talk about leadership. Like, even that concept, I can't talk about it in some groups because they don't believe in leadership. That's like a power over uh, concept. So, well, and it, it comes from an, um, an anarchy kind of uh, correct. orientation. Yeah. Which, if they really understood anarchy, I mean, the default from anarchy is charismatic leadership. You know, wow. and, and this this charismatic leader, you know, we still have one lingering in this yeah. country. Yeah. Um, who yeah, who yeah. mystifies and charms. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very uh, so that's the default from anarchy because anarchy is is not so is not uh self sustaining. It's yeah. not what's the word? You know what I'm looking for. Right. Sustainable. Right. Sustainable. Theory. Sustainable. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. Thank you for, for well, thank you. that I yeah, and I'll, I'll reach out right away. Um, yeah, so thank you. Yeah. I, I like hearing from us who are formally retired but are still working. 
because that's a real test, I think, of who we are and what matters to us as individual practitioners, as well as uh, people who continue to provide something to the literature that others need. And that's what I'm, I'm, I'm doing the best I can with, uh, in, in league with Peter Vale's work. But I want to give you an impression about what I've just heard. <clears throat> While it's clear that there are people who are anti-organization, this thing, this experience you're getting, Maria, this visceral pushback, it's scary. Mm. Uh, and, you know, if we were to look at what would develop organization development, it has to be <clears throat> kind of having a group that wants to work absolutely against organization development. And then maybe that'll put more energy and urgency into our work. Because in some ways we just put this lovely stuff out there, read each other's work and appreciate the heck about it. In the meantime, as you get real close to where people are doing things, that's what you're seeing. Uh, no, we don't, we, we don't want a, a viable Congress house so we're going to destroy the house and it's happening and, and on and on and so um are our thoughts strong enough to give people what they need conceptually and the tools they need to fight back against the anti-organization development trend i don't know i don't know of anyone who's got that kind of clout right now I'll turn this over to Keith. That's right. Hey, there's the hot potato, Keith. I'm yeah, dropping thanks, it Dave. down through Cliff to you. Thanks, uh, yeah, I just thought we we're going to have a light conversation today about something. Yeah, that <laughs> comes later, you know. Right? It's not. Good luck with that. So, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, well, I'm tempted to tell a little story. Uh, Good. Yeah. Go for it. So the work I do, you know, is clearly states we're going to be able to include every voice in shaping what happens next. Um, and we're going to stop the unwitting ways in which, in which we exclude, uh, stifle, and over control. Right? Those, those are pretty strong uh, statements. And um, they're just kind of like, that's, we can do that. And so it turned out, uh, this was a few years ago, but got invited uh, by somebody in Berkeley uh, to hold a workshop. Um, and we were having it in uh, a church in Oakland. And it was one of the places where Black Lives Matter matters really started, you know, really uh, originated. And um, I wasn't directly involved. A bunch of people invited others. And, and so there were a lot of people working on racial justice attending, plus people who just love liberating structures and were from all over the world. Uh, and we start in on this uh, session. I'm introduced. I'm, you know, just leading it, whatever, kind of, or getting things started. Um, uh, in first, the pastor talks and you know, gives a little history of the, the church. And we begin, and, and clearly everybody is super engaged because those things happen when you're using liberating structures, every voice is heard and so forth. Um, but Im immediately a couple people in the group had been working on racial justice for many years, came up and said, well, we need to know your credentials. Ah. We kind of, we really like what you're doing, you know, and even, you know, but we've been doing this work and um, and I went, well, that's really what we're not, you know, the thing that we're not going to do is elevate me or any expert with credentials. You know, for me, that works against what we're, we're doing. Uh, and, and so for a whole day, we kind of went through and different people were highlighted because they'd done more of the work. They, they incorporated some methods into their work and they're not really expert methods but they need to be learned you know they need to be you know uh, developed in you it's a developmental od approach is one way to view it um but 
second day, there was just a big explosion. There's too much privilege. There's micro privilege being extended in every direction. So uh, uh, Rihanna and Marie, that sort of, and it wasn't, it, uh, for me, it was like, are you saying this, you know, it was sort of being canceled. Uh, and yet uh, these were methods that could actually, and were being actively used by people working on racial justice. Uh, so I just had that experience. I am not, you know, coming up with any answers. It was just a very powerful experience. And at the time, uh, some of the things that I was unconsciously and unwittingly doing, which were smaller than the big, you know, smaller, <laughs> they were things like, well, my co-author had a microphone the whole time. Well, he couldn't hear very well and he couldn't, he needed it a soft voice because he had an accident. So a lot of the things that came up were, you know, were upsetting a little bit for me, uh, but I totally understood that I had not been doing the work. I had not, I had all the privileges and a lot of people in the room uh, wanted to know, not just about credentials, but wanted more, uh, wanted it to be more rooted in their direct uh, struggle. Mm -hmm. And so that empathy, that uh, localization of how it is that you're uh, including all voices in shaping what happens next uh, makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So coming in from somewhere else and ta-da, here we are to fix this is, is a trap. Um, and we didn't really do that, but it, at some point we, uh, it's, it, it had to be talked about, right? All of the micro aggressive things. Yeah. yeah. Where, where um, I keep landing uh, to your point, Keith, thank you for that, is um, I, it's, it's literally through, through the whole discussion, I keep coming back to the same place uh, regarding the approach. And it's an OD principle that I learned early on that I forgot about that keeps coming up in this discussion. And it's around the notion of readiness and capability for the change to begin with. Do you even contract? Do you even engage? And I mean, that's an intervention, the decision to enter into um, an engagement process is an intervention in and of itself. And um, assessing the um, the degree to which people are um, ready and capable is the first piece of work, um, and that's the contracting stage. And so, when I think about the work of of Jedi, we call it Jedi in our organization: um, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. We're developing a product, and it's it's very difficult because. There's a barrier to entry. It's called readiness and capability for change. Are, 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 you, are you ready to do this work? And if, if um, and what's the criteria for that? Uh, and there's a power dimension just, <laughs> just right there uh, that, that we're, that we're claiming. We're claim so the, 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 sorry, the, the, I'll leave it here. Um, cause I'm just so, um, wrapped up in this right now, um, that we are very explicit about the power dynamic in our work. It is a polarity around claiming power and mm -hmm. sharing power. And we name it, we name it right up front. Everyone needs to claim their power and their voice. And they also need to share that, that same uh, power with others um so that they can so it's a, it's a self and other um you know a polarity around power <clears throat> um so it's it's just it's it's difficult but there are ground rules that that go along with it and um and and so who makes those rules how are the you know and if you're if you're coming in with oh this sounds like some kind of woke thing and 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 you're in an either or mindset around that or you're in an anarchy mindset where you know uh, who are you you know the medium is the message uh, in terms of 
articulating basically anything, uh, then you know you're you're talking about the two ends of the bell curve um, that are both kind of wing nut five percenters, um, and I'm not interested in working with either of those people. So that's my that's my uh, assertion around uh, doing the work. I want to work with the ninety percent. Um, that's actually willing to have a conversation who may be, you know, edging towards that 5%. But if, but if you're, uh, you know, on the wing nut side of the bell curve, then, um, then you can have that conversation with someone else. I'm just, you know, I'm not going to waste my time. Frankly. Something that resonates really deeply with me right now as you're sharing that, Cliff, is that that I feel like there are a lot of people that are smack dab in the middle of that bell curve that have come to believe that they belong on one of the extremes. Mm. And then, yeah, that, I meet yeah. people that 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 yeah. like I, it feels like we're right here. But mm -hmm. instead of us figuring out, well, what is this point in the middle where maybe we can meet, where we have conversation, where we can have relationship, mm -hmm. society seems to tell us, well, you really belong over here and you belong over here. Yeah, and that's so downside of or thinking becomes, right, the, the either or thing. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and perception seems to be so strong. I'm looking at you with, with a t-shirt that has a continent on it that is near and dear to my heart. But I, mm -hmm. I have a you know, my, my wife is from South America. I showed up in a space with the, the national cricket jersey for Guyana. And it was simply to express, like, I love this woman, really. Like, I happen to love that country, too. But, you know, there was a, a couple of people in that conversation who, like, basically, I later figured out, were immediately caught up in, oh, he's culturally appropriating. He's trying to, like claim a space that's not his and like all this stuff that just me showing up in something that wasn't culturally mine as a you know east german boy but but immediately put and on up the a other side to... it wasn't an american flag so you know you're <laughs> it's not america yeah just i've, I've become <laughs> so uh or i've tried to become more aware of like how do I show up in these places and spaces that I want to be in relationship with to not have an immediate like mm -hmm. perception that that could go against me. But I don't know. I still, I still, still fail plenty of times to get to that conversation about, Hey, could this actually be a polarity rather than an either or that we're dealing with here? Uh, it seems difficult to, to even get to that place. Well, it's no accident that the, the tenets of democracy are in question right now, not mm -hmm. just in the United States, but, uh, globally, because um, it's this either or um, downside of either or dimension where um, anything and is socialism or communism. Right. So. Which is funny because as somebody who grew up in a socialist slash communist society, it was there was all kinds of either or between we would say, you know, yes, we're all equal. There's just some of us that are a little more equal than the rest. And so it was the same <laughs> either or dynamics, whether or not yeah. you you were in the party or weren't in the party anyways that's another yeah one of the conversation yeah. it's just ironic to me that that now has a label that i grew up in that's like you guys have no clue how that worked in practice well, maybe yeah. I'll, I'll jump in for a bit here <clears throat> i feel like we've got a good thick conversation going now <laughs> thick. A lot did you say thick or sick i couldn't hear. <laughs> well, depends so, on the vernacular you choose you could say this is really sick also so and sick. Good things, right <laughs> sick. uh so i'll just add a couple things but maybe the the one of the things that occurs to me as i participate and listen is that this might be another very significant point of evolution of our od field so once upon a time, I feel like the movement in the OD field was to suggest such a radical concept as maybe we could go together, maybe we could connect. And out of that arose some methodologies and such that are pretty key. Like you named some of these, Teo, at the start of the call. Back in the mid 90s, or maybe a little bit sooner, earlier than that, open space was a radical idea. And mm -hmm. World Cafe was an idea just beginning and the use of circle and that grew and evolved, you know, in the in the sort of uh, 
a super overviewing type of history that I pay attention to that grew into things like liberating structures and so many more ways to, you know, based on a premise of maybe if we connected more rather than separated more, we could do some good. Um, Marie, it goes back now, but when you're talking, I just grabbed the book from my shelf. This is Peggy Holman. Yeah. Uh, and it's 13 or so years ago now, but Engaging Emergence speaks to some of that desire to, um, to lend our energy to more relational qualities rather than more siloed qualities. Now, not everybody buys into that, right? But that's a movement within the OD field, if I let myself speak that way. The part that I'm wondering about now and have interest in as a you know, as a next level evolution of our field, it comes back to such deeply personal things to me. So, and, the, and these are the stories, like what are the stories that we are able to both live in our own beings and invite with others that are themselves radical concepts? So for example, I'm with a group last night of men uh, 11 of us, and it's really a space to share some story. It's a men's group, okay? So it's not some grand OD thing or anything like that. In the midst of hearing these stories, what I can recognize is a pretty important theme. These human beings, self-included, we seek belonging. And that's about as basic as it can get. You know, human beings seek a belonging with one another, and there's a lot in contemporary life and all of the structures and things that we live amongst, the political tensions, all of it, you know, contribute to uh, including that, you know, wing nut ends of the bell curve where we're, we're, you know, we're placing people into the extremes or even creating the conditions in which you won't be heard unless you are in one of the extremes. Yeah. So, you know, that just lends a lot. That, that gets me swearing like, Jesus fucking Christ, you know, <laughs> how did we get here kind of stuff? So it's got a lot of oomph in it. But it makes me wonder, back to your original question or invitation tale, it's like, how is it that I and others center a system of belonging, which is more than just a headspace to be in? And I, I lean back to basic things. You know, I've got a design that I'm working on for a thing that's coming up with a group, an all staff group. They're poverty justice lawyers. Um, they, they it, it's proved out over time. They need the most basic, I would say, they need the most basic of formats that pattern connection amongst them rather than separation. You know, I feel like I'm not talking rocket science or anything here. And I rely on a few basic things, circle, world cafe, appreciative inquiry, open space technology, and just keep using those things so that there's even a momentary connectedness that shows up. And, you know, that sounds like low bar material, but I'm starting to wonder if that's just the highest bar we can shoot for. Yeah. A momentary connectedness, an energetic or a remembering of what it feels to be, you know, in, I, I, I won't try for other words right now, in an energetic connection with one another that might just give us the possibility of the tiniest of new ideas that build off of connection rather than blame, shame, guilt, et cetera, all those things. So like I said at the beginning, this is a thick conversation now, but when I try to find, you know, meta narratives, because I'm a person that just gets all dorky about that, I wonder if part of our evolution, part of our imperfect evolution in the field is to reclaim such basic things as formats for momentary belonging that might just change where the ship's headed. Ah, mm -hmm. I'll stop. That gets a little evangelistic. That sounds point. great. Oh, very thoughtful. Mm -hmm. Praise Tennyson. Praise Tennyson. <laughs> yeah. it's gonna clap. <laughs> no, but it's simple shit, though, right? Like yeah. you know, those are big words, shit. and that's a big story, and it takes a lot to live into that individually and communally. Communally, 
But then I go back to basic kinds of things, Keith, that you're, you're, you know, all of us are up to in some way. It's like, all right, there's a lot of stuff going on in the room here, but here's maybe a little simple format that might interrupt the patterns that are so unhealthy. Holy shit. I'll stop. Oh, Rihanna, you're on mute. I'm not hearing a Rihanna. I really want to. <laughs> Do you know what's going mm -hmm. on with Rihanna? Do you? No. Hmm. She's not on mute. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Now we can. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, Tennyson, I loved listening to you just now. And you said toward the end exactly what I was going to interrupt you with, which, which was <laughs> about how, you know, I, I say to, um, white corporate executives I work with who are mostly men, but not all men, you know, I'll say very similar things to what you just said. And, and they'll, they'll come back with, well, you know, there's gotta be more to it than that. And I say, no, it's, it's simple, but that doesn't mean it's easy. If it was easy, we'd all be doing it, you know, cause the, the research is out there about how important belonging and being touched and inclusive being seen and heard um relationship connectedness you know how important that is to mm -hmm. us for us to thrive as individuals in organizations and then for the organizations to thrive it's like it's right there you know we know everything we need to know about it if it was easy um you know i'd be out of work basically um but it, you're right, it's, it's so simple at some level. I just want to really reinforce that point. Sorry, sorry, Keith. Um, Go ahead. I have, a, I have a 20 year career of working with people with developmental disabilities. And one of my biggest moments of humility uh, and, and realization of privilege was to realize that some of the biggest trauma that I was dealing with in the folks in my care was the absence of hugs. Yeah the lack of embrace and the catastrophic power that had for some of the folks that I was caring for. Yeah. And, you know, we, what in the world is stopping us from the occasional hug mm. uh, on, on the other side of that? Mm. Sorry, Keith. Well, it's hard to follow that actually. Um, uh, but I wanted to respond to what you wrote about one, two, four, all. So mm -hmm. could there be anything simpler than taking them in every interaction <laughs> at work or wherever, take one minute to think about an invitation to talk about something, you know, take one, think for yourself and two minutes with one other person. So a little intimacy and then four minutes in a group of four. And uh, did anything happen in your group before that's so exciting? You just have to share it. What's the one thing? Mm -hmm. And uh, every time that's reliable, it will generate reliable thickness, depth, connection, relationship. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really quite, it doesn't matter where I am or where other people who use it, you know, you get that, but and not but a snapback happens so the more convenient thing is to walk into a room you know mm -hmm. sit in the same seat uh have somebody you know take a role that they grab some power and they present or they do or it's actually set up where the expert is going to tell you something and uh, you forget everything uh, that you learned or the experience of a, a one, two, four, all where you actually lose yourself in the belonging. You can't trace your contribution to the larger thing. Um, and also in that, the, where did the decision come from? So there's usually an obsession about, well, we need to make it, we need to get to a place where we make a decision that's going to be a high leverage point that could, you know, that could be about a best practice or, or something else that's gonna make a miraculous change. Um, but in fact, if you continuously do one, two, four, all iteratively and rapidly, uh, a bunch of decisions get made and you don't even know they're made. <laughs> it's just momentum through belonging and extended rapid iterating um, 
a lot of those other things that we think we need the power relations to get to or to accomplish the larger goals that we have um, evaporate. So uh, what's been really amusing, you know, there's a big repertoire in, in work I do of, of all these things, but my co-author always says, well, we really just have five things or 10 things and the rest of it is just uh, not that useful. Let's just make it simple and and recognize always that there's snapback. Mm. It's not a thing um, uh, that we have centuries of buildup to unequal participation and injustice and unwitting over control. So why would we think that our little things that do solve the problem, why would we think that they're going to all of a sudden make a huge difference? We've got to be in it for a, a longer period of time, I think, and reinforce um, the special events are just not going to do it. And simplicity and immediate copyability, you know, immediate, you can adapt it and you can copy it and adapt it immediately, whatever it is. Like one, two, four, all is an example. Is it simple enough uh, that it can be immediately copied? Which was what in what in Teo's little comment about students, <laughs> I can use, it. it's not this, can I use this, is I'm using this. Now that doesn't mean there isn't snapback, right? It doesn't mean that they, uh, they keep using it, but uh, I think part of it is more attention to how the work uh, sticks, how it's enduring. Mm. You know, I, I I love this discussion even about power because um you know some of this discussion of power is an assumption that's I think pretty European. I mean when you look at China, for example, um, you know, I haven't done a lot of work in China, but I've done enough. And um power power is a welcome thing there, you know, uh, there's, there's a billion people there, order is life and death, when they have disruption, millions of people have died in their history. So, of course, there are things we, you know, I, I, I strongly disagree with. But there's a concept called uh, guanxi. And it's like a little guanxi is like your little hub of people. <laughs> it's your belonging world. And to get in is very, very difficult. Like you cannot just go and belong to a team or a group. There has to be like some kind of process where you um, become oriented and are accepted. And usually the leader does that. But the leader with power is seen as a protector. Hmm. It's not seen as power over. It's seen, I, I don't even have the words for it because they're such different paradigms. Um, I wrote a little bit about it in my book and the Center for um, Creative Leadership did some studies about places like China and Poland that have very large power differentials, uh, you know, culturally, um, you know, a lot of deference. And, um, you know, maybe a, a very clumsy way of saying it is be benevolent dictatorship, you know, or I mean, dare I even say, you know, the old feudal system, you know, it's so in Europe, I mean, of course, there were awful things about it, but in its best form, it was intended to protect and grow and create community in a village. I mean, so I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is not everything is, it's not so black and white that everything is good and everything is bad. You know, and I think this is the 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 tricky part, but but I just wanted to name the whole China thing because it's so far from how when we say the word power, I mean they hear it completely differently in, mm. in my experience. Yeah. Yeah. And you well, know, here we here we are. Our methodologies are mostly based on kind of Western um, extroverted speaking, verbal um, intelligences. Individualistic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Marie, um, as I listened to you just now, I was reminded of something that um, that Cliff shared earlier 
about this uh, polarity between, if I got it right, Cliff, uh, between claiming power and sharing power. So um, I, I actually lived in China for almost two years mm -hmm. um, and have had other experiences with kind of collectivist mm -hmm. ways of being and ways of, of yeah. living and so forth. So that's what I was reminded of when I when I heard you, uh, Cliff, talk about um, shared power versus power that was claimed and so forth. And I wonder if that resonates for you, Marie. Yeah, yeah, just, um, and different history, you know, I mean, China is so old, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it, their DNA in terms of the we, I mean, the, when I do like self-reflection, Keith, you know, the, the one of the one, two, four, all, they're like, what? You know, they're like, we, we have to discuss it first and then they we do. can, you they, know, they have all. to go all one, four, two, four. Two, yeah. One. They got to go backwards. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's, it's real. I don't know if Rihanna had that experience, but it was so, it was, it was fun working with them because they came so open hearted, you know, but, but it's just, um, so I'm just, I'm just sitting with um, gratitude in this conversation because um, that belonging piece, I think is the nut. Mm. I mean, it's all about that. And how about, uh, how about uh, for the seven of us right now? What's our sense of belonging in this in this group of seven? Well, I, I was just going to say, I think that uh, socially in this country, um, in my lifetime, which is 80 years, we have lost interest in remaining in place where we can gradually belong all the way through to people coming to our funerals. I mean, that's how I grew up in Maine. And the whole notion of going away, to Rihanna's point, was, oh, you'll come back. <clears throat> but but what's happened, I think, is this temporary society, who wrote that? Someone did. I read it. Uh, has taken hold. And so when someone is given the prospect of opening up themselves in order to be accepted and to belong, they're looking at it and saying, well, no, I, 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 it's okay. I, I don't need this affiliation. I don't, I'm going to be moving anyway. Now what we have as a result of that, as a symptom of that, is enormous loneliness in this country. It's, it's like a plague of loneliness that I keep loneliness. hearing about in various media. Because people now thinking, well, I I shouldn't have let go of all those line, lines of connection. You know, I, I'm stranded out here. Nobody notices or cares. So that's my my empath my uh, emotional reaction to what I've been hearing. I loved your question, Rihanna. <laughs> it's like, okay, what's here right now? Why why are yeah? I'm yeah. I'm a big believer in the here and now it's a lot of my work and uh you know because everything we need is in the room that's one of my beliefs um and i love what's showing up in chat thank you all i i have a strong sense of belonging here and it's really heart and gut centered because in my head you know the cognitive level uh, i say to myself you know you grew up on a farm and you don't belong in a group like this, you know, but in my heart and my gut, I'm feeling it. You do? <laughs> yeah. I do. Uh, so even feeling like we belong for an hour is better than having a whole day go by without any sense of this at all. So I'll settle for an hour. It feels good. <laughs> It's the, the the research on belonging, I believe, start and touch, the importance of touch started with the studies that were done back in the 60s, maybe, um, and 70s on um, why orphan babies were dying in Russia at yeah. such a high rate, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's kind of grown from there. It's so persuasive. But then on, you know, in Jung's theory of personality type, my preference is for intuition and feeling NF. And we're just sort of 
natural empath belonging types. We want everyone to belong. Albert, oh my goodness. You jumped into the middle of something, Albert. <laughs> Welcome to this thickness. <laughs> he can summarize for us. Right. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was in another meeting and it just got away from me. So I wanted to at least stop in and say hello. Tell us what your hat says. My hat says Miller's at Milwaukee. <laughs> oh. Gary Miller invented an engine that was the most successful engine in the history of Indianapolis Motor Speedway racing. And every year, a group of people who have restored vintage Indianapolis race cars get together in Milwaukee at the one mile track and race around with their cars. They don't actually race, but they take them out and um, it's a time for people who are interested in the history of auto racing in the United States to hang out with some really gorgeous equipment. Wow. Cool. Yeah, there's, there's belonging. See, that, maybe yeah. this is going on in all kinds of ways that we haven't given credit to. All kinds of affinity groups who love racing cars from, from the past or love this or who go cross mountains and rivers to get to a, an assembly of people who have similar interests and, and hobbies and all of that. And I think we can't ignore that. Maybe we can build on it actually. Mm -hmm. What have you guys been talking about? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> power. We've been talking about power. Power, power and belonging. belonging. Who's power in and who's and belonging, out. Yeah. Power, power and belonging. belonging. And being yeah. excluded or included and uh, the very basic and very simple powerful thought that's coming through from people. Rihanna, uh, when you were speaking on, oh, I'm sorry, Dave. I'm done. Rihanna, when you were speaking on, on touch and the importance of, of touch, when I, when I had that experience that I shared with you all around the, the trauma for lack of, yeah, you know, not the, the trauma, not for something happening to the person, but the absence mm -hmm. of, of affection. Of, There's of a, touch. Uh, um, you said touch to you. Right. Yeah. yeah um, hugs. Yeah. Lack of, lack of embrace. There's a, an anecdotal piece of research that supposedly happened. Some German duke in the 1500s decided he was going to find out the the origin language that humans have. He was convinced that if we would just be left alone, we'd start speaking either Hebrew or Latin or Greek. Mm. And so he isolated a bunch of infants from the surrounding village, brought them up, had them you know, taken care of in the castle. They were nursed. They were changed, everything, everything, except that the wet nurses were not allowed to speak to them and they weren't allowed to hold them beyond nursing. And oh supposedly, anecdotally, every last one of them died in within a month and a half. Oh, I was going to say, this sounds like my ancestors and why I am where I am. But since they all died, <laughs> then I don't need to worry about that. Yeah, ne <laughs> neither one of us are from, from there because they didn't make it, supposedly. <laughs> Good Lord. Oh, my God. Oh, they all died within a month and a half. Yeah, but no language. They heard, they heard no words. No language so. and no touch. No. And maybe Other the than, combination. You know, for the... the so what I wonder about is like this, uh, this is me that is a practitioner trying to connect that reality that you just spoke to with some of what we've talked about. And Albert, you coming in in this moment and say, hey, what's going on in the party? You know, that kind of thing <laughs> is to me. I, I know that I when I'm working with a group. Uh, I'm often trying to find a departure from the norm mm -hmm. that maybe takes us out to Albert, in your example, the racetrack, mm -hmm. right? And if I connect in the theme of touch and language and stuff, now I'm going to hypothesize and speculate a little bit to say, broadly speaking, humans are less in touch with our own stories, our own passions, our own longings, especially in organizational contexts. And so from a facilitating, facilitating perspective, being able to invoke or invite and take them back even to a momentary like, so who were you as a kid or what were you good at as a kid kind of stuff, right? Those, those sort of oblique prompts, it's almost like that creates this moment of touch or this moment of language that is traditionally ostracized from the process of strategic work and doing all the good things that we need to do. 
and part of what I feel like I keep learning this is is just like the 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 potency of such a departure to perhaps invite a more holistic way of being into the group into the room into ourselves because I'm going back like those again those are those are deeply human values that I love to work with and feel like that's part of what I bring into a room or you know that kind of instinct and desire but where that comes from is the reality going back Marie to something you said um, in your earlier voice, we've got so many people that can't talk to each other anymore. We, we, we don't even value the talking to each other anymore. Like this is a waste of time. We've got to get to work kind of stuff. The reality is that is so deeply patterned. And what brings excitement to me is within our field, within our OD field is the reclaiming or perhaps the restoring of such oblique ways to connect and belong it, it might just change who we are at, at very deep dna kinds of layers i have some hope in that you know wow that's good thoughts that's why i wanted to ask albert uh to to tell us what his hat says immediately a story came forth yeah yeah and uh the story the the whole theme of the story was around a group where belonging and connection and shared passion happens. Yep, and it's entirely possible for a group who have a shared interest to come together having never been met before yeah. and to suddenly be belong, right? To know that you belong. And that I think is the magic of having a more holistic view of relationships. We are not task exclusive mm -hmm. we are relationship seeking before task mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then because of task because if you learn to work on those motors mm -hmm. and those cars now that knowledge that you bring enhances the chance that others will pay attention and and, and on it goes so it's a circle not a not a line it's not yeah yep. it, it's it's a beautiful system and when we all know people who have devoted themselves to what we we shouldn't even call a hobby, it's just yeah. a way of them being. It's a practice yeah. that matters to them, mm -hmm. and it and it grows them, and it grows the people around them, and it makes society a lot more interesting. Yeah, yeah. it's sexy. Work is mm -hmm. sexy. See, that that's a beautiful thing that just happened here. I think with Rihanna naming and Albert talking the story and Dave kind of acknowledging a group that I'm guessing you don't belong to, Dave, you know. No, I can't. But, I drive yeah. a car, that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, at the danger, though, becomes, I think, creating belong, uh, maybe a false, I, I don't know, it still is a sense of belonging, I guess, by making demons out of or creating enemies out of the other. Because yeah. now you and I are... We we're together, but it's only because there's this other, yeah, that we uh, we oppose. Yeah, the yeah. presence is always uh, in. I think in the backs of all human minds, it's predators, basically. Uh, what keeps us unsafe? You know that that's a big question. We we are have a brainstem that's looking, or a good part of our brain that's always looking for predators, and some so of them happen to be humans. Important. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my, my colleague uh, and mentor Barry Johnson um, has a habit of of reminding or saying, and perhaps reminding uh, that the, the tape that's running for pretty much everyone is, um, "Do you care about me?" I mean, that's the question that's being asked most of the time: is, "Does this person or does this group mm. care about me?" and to the point of belonging um that's been a, a string in this conversation i think um you know that's just a another reminder hmm. i put something in chat uh because uh, maybe i even shared the last time i was one of these calls but it's it's a, a grief walking activity mm -hmm. and the reason i put it there is um some of the times it's used, it's a way to tap social support after a loss. And so the way that it's being used often is 
well, sometimes at companies where a whole group of people are now gone, <laughs> you know, or where mm -hmm. groups have been, you know, here, these were my people that I belong with and now they're not here. Uh, we really hurt. Uh, and um, I, I've been working with this over a few, well, multiple years, and now more people are using it and getting interesting results with it. And what the, the reason I think it's pertinent here is uh, the degree to which quickly um, a group can handle almost anything if they feel like they belong to each other or they exist for it, with each other. Uh, and I, I wasn't at all sure that something like a death or a loss of colleagues or uh, hmm. I've personally been involved in enough of individuals saying, I, I wanna actually share what I'm grieving and mm -hmm. it can be really anything. And if you can think of some terrible loss, I've probably been guiding someone with a bunch of other people trying to support them in, hmm. in that loss. And it's, it's quite breathtaking. And I wasn't at all sure it would work. You know, it, hmm. and working just means that people feel whole afterward, feel like they have a whole group of people that you not maybe? only they belong with, but they're there for them. They have their back through uh, the grief. Mm -hmm. Keith, that just reminds me of a of an often used quote that I don't know who said it, but it I've, I've repeated it a hundred times around all change involves loss and all loss involves grief. So this is uh, beautiful in terms of, a, of an approach to grief. Yeah, it's both. Uh, it's one of the my favorite things to do, mm -hmm. uh, but it wrecks me for the whole day. Uh, yeah. Usually, you know, I'm just oh. in pieces yeah. afterward, even though I can kind of hold it together. You know, I'm a professional, but I, I'm not I'm not holding it together. So the first time I did it, somebody decided to walk their and walk their grief means you say it out loud. Um, guy, a good friend in our user group was losing his sight. The second time, a woman couldn't conceive. The third time, my mentor just died. Uh, uh, I'm from Syria. My entire family and lineage were killed. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm shortening up what they actually said because the four questions in this thing sort of build from, yes, it's true that... Um, <clears throat> always remember and never forget it sort of amplifies the loss and then uh, work through it but the range of what people can do if they choose to support each other uh, got <clears throat> expanded for me in this work yeah like dramatically expanded my confidence in people to handle to be there for each other got expanded and uh you know go wild with it if it works for you because the losses right now are piling up <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, dave you make me laugh because yeah not only are they piling up there's somebody coming for me maybe you know mm -hmm. it feels like as the losses pile up i think you can feel more like somebody's coming for me yeah yeah well you know, I, this, I, 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 go ahead i was just gonna say the the this is a jam. I like that because uh, <laughs> it's only, I think, my, my fifth one as a one of the new authors. But what I'm also thinking, ooh, is, is that in our conversations like this, as part of our brain is already working. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Here we are. We what the hell is that? Is already working on uh, something we'll write differently, something we'll do differently in the way we conduct a meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, we're shaping uh, each other's uh, ab ability to see things in, in ways that ultimately our readers or our clients or others would like us to offer. So maybe this is more than just a jam. Mm -hmm. It's a seminal opportunity for seven or eight people to um, get better. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm honored to be with this group and I hope I can come back and belong again next time. <laughs> Super rich. Thank you for today. Yeah.
Thanks, Very everyone. Nice. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, as, as as we close, I just want to say, Keith, I love that. And that's why I think breath awareness, mindfulness, it's really to calm that amygdala. Uh, I just think what you said about grief is so beautiful and powerful. So thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to email you, Rihanna. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Thanks all. Go well. Thank you all. Thanks for Thank you, Tail. Thank you, Tail. Absolutely. Yeah. Take Bye -bye. care, everybody.